Hi, welcome to The Stitch TV Show. I'm Lynn. And I'm Pam. We're happy you're joining us today. The Stitch is an online quilting talk show, the perfect soundtrack for your sewing room. Join us for quilty talk shows, virtual stitch-ins, <laughs> celebrity interviews, and podcasts. Learn more at thestitchtvshow.com. Those all got real dramatic. Uh, yeah. Go gay. Our show is brought to you by <laughs> Ink and Arrow Fabrics, a division of QT Fabrics. The pixie dots are on the table <gasps> and very lovely. Lots of pixie dots. I, li I really like them. I know. Like, I think, can I enter our, can no. I? No. Em anyway. Employees and relatives of the Stitch TV show are not eligible. So today we're <laughs> going to be talking about long arm quilting tips and how to, how people choose quilting patterns and books. And we're also joined by our new quilt pattern, Main Squeeze, and it's a layer cake friendly digital quilt pattern is available at shop.thestitchtvshow.com. So, Lynn. Yes. What you been doing? You know, I started teaching at a local quilt store mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Fancy. Fancy. And so I my first class that I taught was machine applique, which I enjoy. And it was a great class. And I came up with a great, well, you know, we should put a picture of the little design that it's I... It's actually out on our website already. Oh, there you go. And so taught people how to do machine applique and some tips about that. Cool. So it was fun. I like teaching. I really like teaching. Like, you know. You know when you're kind of in your... It's your jam, whatever. And it's like... Because it's my jam. I, I enjoy... I enjoy the whole teaching process. I, I've probably done that professionally my whole life, really. But I've decided it's genetic. Like, I, we had a family reunion in um, July, and probably most of, my co most of my cousins, our teachers, were teachers. And then all of their children, most of them are teachers or were teachers. And so it's kind of like we've all got that gene. We're a teaching family. Everybody goes, do you know how that works? Here, let me explain it to you. <laughs> it's a very informative family reunion. <laughs> Meanwhile, my family reunions really driven by the the organizational plan that was put together, the timing spreadsheet, the <laughs> yeah. who's bringing what, yeah. like, yeah. And a lot of it's it's so cute because one of my cousins, uh, several of them are early childhood or kindergarten, first grade teachers and so they're so fun we were playing a game and one of them's like oh, that's such a good answer to me and I was like wow you are such a first grade teacher <laughs> they were always positive about everybody's answer in the game it was very you know meanwhile we're like you're five minutes late you're jacked at the schedule no you're out no 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 they're all early childhood teachers so very positive <laughs> all righty we Forgot to put in here what the heck we're going to be talking about. So, first <laughs> topic, long arm quilting tips. And second topic, choosing quilt patterns. No, wait, we did cover that. I, Go me. I, I have it. had short-term memory issues, apparently. In the last 30 seconds. Welcome right. to my stroke. Okay. <laughs> Do you smell toast burning? <laughs> you did ask me that last night at dinner. But legitimately right. toast was burning, so I was not having a stroke last yeah, night. Yeah, she was. was like, She's like, do you smell toast burning? I said, yes. She goes, oh, good. okay. <laughs> and I literally didn't know that that was a sign oh, yeah. of stroke. So yeah. I was like, well, good to know that. Again, a teacher learning information. Anyway, <laughs> long arm tips. How? What long arm tips do what you have, Pam? Ever. <laughs> Quilted on my long arm. I have, but not nearly with as much proficiency as I have on domestic machine quilting, which is why I spent like, I don't know, 45 minutes talking about it a couple episodes ago. <laughs> so I, was I like, do have several. We're like, doing this topic, so I can just sit back and have a nice drink you while you just to talk to me. Chit chat. Okay, so I should talk about my tips then. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the very first thing that you do when you start quilting on a long arm? Very first thing. Make sure your backing's big enough. Yes, that's true. Great tip. See? You need something. Great tip. Mm -hmm. Why do you want your backing big enough? So you won't yell at me. <laughs> so, the way with the frame and the thing. 
in domestic machine quilting, you're moving the fabric. And as long as you have enough on the edge to hold on to, you're cool. So it could be right. yeah, one to two inches, depending on really the size of the project. With a long arm, you need that extra space because the ability of the machine to travel to the edge of the top means that it's going to bump into the frame at some point if it's a super big quilt. Well, it's the width of the machine. Yes. Um, bumps into the tension. The machine bed. Yeah, the machine bed. It needs to be, so it depends on what machine you're looking at, but that width is usually about four to five inches. So you want four to five inches on all the sides so that it's not bumping into your stabilizer, whether it's zippers or pins or um, whatever, the holding the whatever the holds the edges to give you that flat base. You need that extra width around it. And most long, if you take your quilts to a long armor, they will tell you how much they want for their machine. And they're not just telling you that because they want you to buy more fabric. They're telling you that so that when they're quilting to the edge of your quilt, they're not going to bump into something and move the machine and it look jacked up on the edge. Um, and I've heard that some of them will, if you don't give them that space... They will sew something to the edge of your backing so that they get it, and they'll charge you for that. So, you know, just whatever. Very important to have that space around the edge of your machine. So, Was that on your list? It wasn't on my <gasps> list. So, see? Yay you me. Now I can sit back and relax. <laughs> the, thing, the next thing you need to do is to make sure that you load it with even tension. And I see people load machines, and you want it to be flat when you're loading it. So... You want the tension to be, and I'm talking about the backing, because I float all my tops, which we'll talk about in a second. But you want that to be even. So you want the, when you're attaching it to the, the back of your quilt attaches to the bars on the back of the machine. And then the bottom of your quilt, of the back of the bottom of your quilt, attaches to a what they call a belly bar or something down here. And, um... So you want that space between those two bars, that tension, to be even. You don't want it too tight, and you don't want it, like, too loose. The so, go. question. Yes. Sometimes I have loaded a back on your machine, mm -hmm. and there's nice tension, like, bounce a quarter off of it. Right. Like a military bed <laughs> making in the center, but... It's a little wobblier on the edge. Yeah. Why, why is that? It has to do with the weave of the fabric and how you're loading it. And so that's what you want to pay attention to. If you're seeing that, I will go back and I will just move that edges of the fabric. I'll move that in my... And it looks like I'm loading it unevenly. Right. But because I've given myself that space, I it'll even out. It'll give me a really nice flat back, which is what you want. Flat back. <laughs> you want a flat back. I don't know if that's good or not. I mean, other things. So, but you want that tension consistent. And, and really, that's one of the big keys to helping the tension of your machine be consistent, too. Because if it's, you know, when you're sewing through it and it's like you've got wrinkles or whatever in the back, you don't want that. It's not cool. It's not cool. So, um, you want your tension consistent. You want to anchor the tops and the sides. And I float, like I use, um, a lot of machines have just like little clamps. Mm -hmm. I actually bought a, and I don't remember what the name of the company was, but I actually bought a, a, snappers. a snapper. Well, it was a different company too. I actually bought a, a length of a so there's a Tinch, tube. There's a tube, and you snap something on top of it, right. and it gives you tension the entire width of that yeah. sewing of space. Two giant clothespins yeah. is what a lot of them come with. Right, which does which gives you uneven tension, right. which I don't like. Um, here's something that I do that almost with almost every quilt is I before I start quilting a quilt, I will look at my design. And I will actually draw out, I'll sketch the block, and I will draw out on a, on, in a scrapbook or in a, you know, one of those artist books with blank pages, I draw the quilting design 
on the block. So I know what I'm doing, and I have that as a reference kind of behind me to look at, to go, oh, what am I supposed to do in this? Oh, yeah, I'm doing that, you know, so I'll do that. Um, another, another thing that I do that I think is really super important to do is I set a timer on my watch or I set, I know that a music that I'm listening to is so long and when, I don't know. What music would that be, Lynn? Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to other music too, or I'll listen to, um, I listen to books, or I listen to podcasts, or I listen to, you know, different, I actually listen to sermons. I enjoy that. And I know how long they're going to be. And I will set a timer on my watch to make sure when it goes off, I finish whatever area I'm in and I walk away. And I go sit down. I go upstairs. I do something else. But I walk away from this position so that I am relaxing my muscles and changing them so that I don't get super sore. Because if I'm quilting for eight hours solid, I get too sore the next yeah. day. So I set timers on my watch or I know when certain things are going to be over and I tell myself, okay, now go read a chapter in a book or go watch a 30 minute television show or do something else. Yeah. Go cook dinner or whatever. Well, and that's something that's important, even if it's not just long arm quilting, any kind, even domestic machine, because there's a lot more yeah. body tension in yeah. wrangling the quilt to move it around. Yes. So I think that's important no matter what kind of quilting you're doing. Yeah. So it's, and just set a timer. Like my watch has a timer. Are your, my iPhone has timers on it. There's a timer built in to my sit down mid arm. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Use them. Use the timers. Definitely. Um, the other thing I do is I take pictures of my designs, especially if as I'm quilting. So, for example, I will quilt a border. Well, by the time I need to repeat that border at the bottom of my quilt, it's already rolled up. And I'm like, how did I do that again? So if I've taken pictures of what that quilting looked like in that corner, you know, setting stone square on that border, and I've taken a picture of it, then I know how to repeat it. Now, and I also have the reference if I've drawn it, but taking a picture is just that other backup of, you know, I may have drawn it a certain way and quilted it a little bit, you know, because things can change. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. You're surprised. So take a picture. Always practice. And I can't, I can't say it enough. Practice drawing in a sketchbook. Practice, practice, practice. That helps so much. Um, don't get caught up in your mistakes. Move on. You screw something up, nobody's going to know it. Move on. Just when do you unpick? If it is um, a mechanical failure, a mechanical like failure, issue, attention but not a issue. design, not failure. a design, usually not a design, a design opportunity. Issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a little extra love right there in the quote. <laughs> and and like so, if I know I want to stay in this green area, and I accidentally go out in this area. Yeah. You know, is it my sh is it a show quilt? Is it a is it a quilt that's one of our patterns that could be seen in quilt stores? Is it just something for Lynn? You know, um, it depends. And can I fix that in other ways? So let's say that I've sewn, gr you know, a different color in the orange, and it shows up. Can I take an orange marker and hide those stitches? Because I will. So, yeah, just if you make mistakes, move on. Because I promise you, you're probably not going to see them once it comes off the machine. I have been very disappointed in some of my quilting on the machine and taken it off, walked away from it, come back the next day and went, what was I complaining about? That looks good. And I think it's just walking away from it sometimes. So don't get so wrapped up in, I screwed this up or whatever. Walk away from it. And, and you asked me about tension. That's when I pull stuff out if the tension's jacked up. But to prevent that from happening, every time you change a bobbin, go to the side and check your tension of that bobbin. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I also do it if I've walked away and I'm in the middle of a bobbin um, and I've moved the machine to a different area or something and I've not been there for a little bit or I'm quilting the next morning, I check that tension again just to make sure that I'm not going to be surprised. That the gremlins didn't get to it. Yeah, exactly. With stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, I mean, that's a key. I mean, if you're getting tired or the machine is acting up, you know, do some of the basic things that you would do if you were stitching a, you know, if you're piecing a quilt, change the needle, you know, oil your machine, clean out the bobbin area, do all the, re-thread the whole machine, take it out, re-thread it, just to make sure you're in the tension discs and You've got the, it's going through right. I just change bobbins. If you're having a lot of breakage or whatever, do all those kind of basic things. And then some days you just have to walk away. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, and I dip my thread. Like, so if it's some of those issues, you know, I'll dip my thread, which we've and, talked about in other well, stores. But refresh. But to refresh is, <laughs> so, um, Mineral oil, the clear mineral oil that you can get at the digestive aisle of your local grocery store. <laughs> yes. If you're going for a colonoscopy, you'll know where this is. Or you have a young child. <laughs> so <laughs> I will take my thread and I will actually dip it in the mineral oil to where it soaks into the thread. Pull it out and then wipe all the excess away. This just adds enough oil to the thread that it that it oils the machine as it goes through it, and it quiets. It's it's amazing what it, like, your machine may be making noise, and after you've dipped your thread, it's, like, peaceful. It's incredible. So, I and I'll dip my thread. So, and that's another one of my, kind of, if something's acting up, I kind of go through all those steps. Before I get frustrated, I mean, and I'm not saying that that's the only thing that can go wrong, um, but those are all my go-tos first before I get to, well, did I throw it out of timing or did I whatever, those kinds of things. I don't, Do I have to buy a new machine? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, my other tip is always wear clothes that you can put your iPod or um, iPhone or whatever Android phone, whatever you're listening to, you can put it on your body. In a pocket. In a pocket or something so that you can have earphones in. I don't put it in my I've bra. Maybe I've done that a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I've Well, if I put on that. pajamas, my pajamas don't typically have pockets, but I may still have on a somewhat professional upper half. <laughs> I can't say I've ever. No. So I always like, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't sew in yoga pants because I don't have pockets. But. So I do have a, a solution for that. Okay. So um, you can, no, it's a legit solution. Okay. And it only costs like 50 cents. Okay. I'm listening. If you have access to this store. So a local home improvement store in the United States, it's a big chain. This logo's orange. Uh, they were established in Atlanta. Yes. They sell canvas aprons that are about oh, this yes, tall by about this wide. About. And it's 50 cents for one of these aprons. Now it has their logo on the front. I have taken that. And just stitched a piece of fabric over that and made another set of pockets. I think you gave me one of those. I think I did. Yeah, I like it. And so the total cost for me was less than a dollar. And it's a little apron that I can tie on if I'm wearing pajamas or yoga pants or whatever and, like, tuck stuff in there. Yeah. So there there's go. way cuter options than, like, this canvas thing. But, you know, hey, it was less than a dollar. So. There you go. Well, I or you I get, like the professional armband. Yeah, you can get the armband <laughs> that people exercise in. I always like to listen to something when I'm long arming. And my other tip is have a signal that your children or husband or whoever needs to talk to you while you're long arming can signal you to stop without having to come up behind you. Because <laughs> then it's like this. Now, the only one who doesn't follow this in my household is my dog. <laughs> Josie comes up and paws me, and it scares the snot out of me. I'm like, oh, Josie. <laughs> and then she looks so cute, like, Mom, but I need to go out. Please let me out of the domicile. So you can't be mad at her, but you usually have to take out that 
unless I recovered well. <laughs> because she'll sit there first, and if you didn't see her, then she'll paw at you because she's bad. <laughs> so I always listen to music or, you know, podcasts or whatever. You could listen to the Stitch TV show. We do podcasts. That would be excellent. And you, when you know it's over, walk away. See, that's a good timing thing for you. Or the Hip to Be a Square podcast. Both would be perfect. Those are a little shorter. <laughs> They're a little shorter. So, you know, you can have, you can listen to two and then get a break. There you go. And my breaks are usually about an hour. Like I'll stitch for an hour and then I'll take a break. Just FYI. Um, have an extra pair, even if you don't need reading glasses and I don't really need them. I'm just in the past year started wearing them in my normal glasses. Um, but they drive me nuts, so most of the time I do this to read. Um, I don't know why they put them in there, I've decided. But have an extra pair of reading glasses with just a, a small magnification. Because if you're doing really intricate micro quilting, it just gives you another, it's a magnification that allows you to see that stuff. <laughs> why are you laughing? Well... Because I do that. No, no. It's more the image of the giant flip-down magnifiers oh, no. that I think were featured in maybe the Ghostbusters movie oh, in right. the 80s. And, just a <laughs> and that's, yeah, that image popped in my head and it made me laugh. Okay. Um, the other thing, now this is an expensive thing, but I have a, a chair that I can, if I'm doing a lot of intricate quilting in one area, and I do thread painting, so some of it's really... I spend a lot of time in one area. Um, I have a chair that I sit on, and it's a saddle chair, so it's really comfortable to sit on. And it's high. It puts me up at the right height for the long arm. So my long arm is set to where I can stand at my height, or I use this high chair that I... And that's expensive, but it's worth it for me. Um, saddle chair was nice. Another big tip, when you long arm and you roll it and you've got this, I mean, mine's a 26 inch throat. So you've got, you can do a 12 inch block on point uh, and see it all in one area. But when you're quilting out here, you don't have as much control as if you're quilting here. You want to always quilt in your sweet spot because this will cause you to lean over and not be good on your back and stuff, and then you take much smaller, or more breaks more often, um, but you wanna quilt in your sweet spot. Don't try to quilt, and I'm not saying I'm good at this, because I will try to quilt out here, but if I'm doing intricate work, I want it right in front of me. So don't, don't try to quilt like this. Use it right here, stay in your sweet spot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, always clean the rails that your the wheels sit on or roll on. Clean them daily. And maybe after a big quilt, you want to make sure and clean them if you're going to do another quilt on that. Um, Why is that? Because they can, the wheels can... Um, uh, flake off or whatever because they're rubber. Yeah. So I clean them. Make sure that there's no dust or particles. Make sure that the other thing that will happen that I've seen happen is stray threads get caught up in them, and then it'll jerk your machine. So make sure they're clear of everything. Yeah, minor speed bumps can cause big issues. Exactly. Where you're like, why isn't this working? That's how I said my finger once. Um, in class, by the way. So clean out and clean out the dust bobbin area, the bobbin, the dust in the bobbin area regularly. And I usually do it after every other bobbin, you know, so it depends on, you know, how much you're doing. Now I use a poly thread when I quilt, so I don't get as much dust, but that doesn't mean it still doesn't get dusty. Yeah, because there's still batting that's moving yeah. through. And it still gets dusty. It still gets stuff in that bottom end area. So you still want to do it. But poly threads definitely cut that down. If you're using cotton threads, I don't know that I wouldn't clean it out every. Yeah. And don't use air. Um, compressed air. Compressed air to do it. You want to. You don't want to blow in. You want to pull out. Suck out. Yeah. So. 
those are all my major tips. I mean, there's a lot of other things, like if you're doing writing and stuff like that. But How do you make sure that the needle's in the right way? Because long arm needles, and even for my sit-down mid-arm, the shank is entirely round. It doesn't have that no, it flat doesn't. spot in it. There is <laughs> one machine that does have that, and that's the Bernina long arm. It has a flat back, and they use a standard needle. But other machines, I don't think there's another machine on the market that doesn't use that round industrial. Yeah, so how do you make sure it's in right? Um, again, once you change a needle, you test it. And you can see when the stitch is long, but you want it lined up straight with the head of the machine so that eye is straight. And yet... In the forum, in the Facebook group for my brand of machine, sometimes there is a recommendation of if you have it straight, so if you consider it like 6 o'clock mm -hmm. on a clock face, try it just at 5.30. Oh, really? Because the way my machine threads, threads uh, then you need to that pay, little, yeah. Then you need to pay attention to your manufacturer. There's yeah. no right answer to that at that point. Yeah. I probably don't change my needle as much as I should. But I'm bad about that with my yeah, standard. Yeah, yeah. Regular. So regular. My regular, my regular machine. Yeah. But. Whew. All right. That that's was, a lot of tips. That's a lot of tips. Hopefully those are helpful though. So we're going to take a little break. Going to take a closer look at main squeeze behind us and we'll be right back. So, we are now going to talk about how the heck you choose patterns or books. And it's not just as simple as, like, strolling up. I would like to spend $10 on something. I will take this one. So, what do you look for when you are buying a quilt pattern or book? I think that's a good question. That's why we have it on the show. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, first I have to be attracted to it. Like, I have to look at the picture on the pattern or the books, and I have to, like, go, those are cool looking. So you or... have to like someone else's color and fabric selection in order to want to do No, not, not necessarily co a color and fabric selection, because I do have the ability to go, I, I can see that in other things. But I do have to like the pattern. or I like something about it, whether it's the colors or the pattern or... Um, you know, the I shape. think you have to, the shape. The size. Yes. What do I need it the for? The assembly technique. Yeah. What do I need it for? You know, am I buying it to, you know, for a certain problem or, you know, yeah. I want to make a quilt because of this? Yeah, one of the first things I look for is can this be adapted and useful so can I use it for more than just the intended purpose? Never so, think about that. Well, no. For, so for me, it's <laughs> I know like... you do. So when you design this quilt, it's humongous. I'm like, I don't need a quilt that big. But do we... What do we do to make it smaller? Do, are the instructions for that provided? Or is it something I could easily do myself? Or do I just need to make the same number of blocks and just shrink them down? Well, that's more work so, than I may want to do. So, right, yeah. yeah. Pass. <laughs> Pam's not buying my pattern. That's what she said. Conveniently, I know where it is already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but the other thing is, for me, when I'm looking at books or patterns, is I always ask the question, have I tried this before? You know, I will buy something because I've never done curve piece. I have done curve piecing, but when I bought patterns in the beginning, I was like, I've never done curve piecing. I want to try that. Here's a book on curve piecing or yeah. a pattern that has curve piecing. So part of me is the challenge of, have I ever done this before? Ever tried it before? You know, I'll be interested in to do it. I have that same criteria, but not from the, I've never done it before of, do I already own something? in my library that could teach me this or maybe the which no, speaks to the are you aware of what you currently own so you're mm -hmm. not just buying the same pattern over and over and over again and then all of a sudden you've got six patterns that look very similar just because you like the shape or the or the yeah. or the look of the quilt and you're like right. oh, shoot I could have I didn't need to spend 
50 extra dollars because the quilt pattern in the U.S. is typically $10 or even more. Right. Depending on if it's applique, there's there yeah, can be even more. Even more paper piece and more. Yeah. Yeah. And so is it is it dissimilar to things I already own? Because hmm. a lot of the, the books that I buy, I don't tend to buy a lot of independent patterns. I tend to go for the book because one quilt pattern is $10. Well, you can get 12 quilt patterns in a book that only costs 20, 24. 24. Yeah. That's a better deal better bang for the buck. better bang for the buck so but with a book i won't buy it if there's only one pattern in there that i'm drawn to i need to want to make at least two of the quilts in there i agree when i'm looking at a book i'm like does this have more than just the one pattern i'm attracted to Yeah, yeah definitely definitely and i like a book to have um Maybe not different sizes, like they're not all the same size of quilt. Right. There's a or they give me options of how do I make it smaller. I like that aspect of books too. Yeah. But I look at books for reference material too. Like I need to know and, and part of this comes from my quilt appraisal mindset in that the more techniques and references I understand, the better appraiser I am Mm -hmm. because I understand you know, what it takes to make that or what it takes to create that look, that technique or whatever, how long or how complicated or how easy it is. Mm -hmm. Because there's some that look super complicated and you're like, you know, it's not. Yeah. It's not. But, um, I, so I look at books as references. Is this a good foundational book on that technique or a good foundational book for that, um, you know, that author Mm -hmm. or that. And I look at authors too, authors or quilt celebrity. I'm drawn to books by people I've met, Mm -hmm. you know, or people that um, I respect because they've, like I've got several Georgia bone steel books. Never made a quilt out of them. Never will. I don't think I will probably ever use her books, but she was one of the main forerunners in the revival of quilting and had a talk show for years and on a a public television and it's well known. So, I mean, I have some of her books because of that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Same with, same with um, little quilt books. You know, I have a lot of those. Marianne Van Alt. Yeah. One of my criteria was, do I know the author? Because one of the ways that you show support vote with your dollars and i know this person i like this person i believe in their talent i want them to stay in business right i will go spend money on their book (laughs) or their pattern or you know whatever now do you ever get and i do this do you ever get trapped into and i say trapped but caught up in the series it's something i do in normal fiction reading but i don't know that i have okay there may be one example where i have in quilting okay because of the sizes that i use to cut my scraps up into they exactly mimic uh joan ford who is i think her third book just came out and so all of her quilt patterns that she writes use these same sizes two inch squares three and a half inch squares five inch squares Mm -hmm. ten inch squares and you know some different strip widths and so those are perfect if i just need to make a quilt and I've got all this stuff already cut and it's just a matter of getting colors that look good together. So I have bought, I haven't got her third book yet, but I have the other two only be, and it's not like I'm in love with every quilt in there, but I know like, oh, well, this is something that I could easily make using the stuff that I've already got cut and hooray, less cutting because it's not my favorite part. Well, I, I, I do that, but it's different. Like I'm very into series of and this is just me probably, um, but like there was, there's a pattern company now that's got these pillows. Mm, yes. And they've come out in like different seasons and different holidays and different, and I'm like all over that Jack Tech. So I have bought several of their patterns because one, I've got this uh, bench in my kitchen that I put this pillow on and I'm changing the you know, I have the Valentine's Day one and a Christmas one and whatever. It's too much energy. And but I like <laughs> I that, that. But I like the whole, you know, it's a series kind of thing. Like I get caught up in, you know, I've bought applique patterns because of the series of, you know, 
12 Days of Christmas or because of the series of these cute little nutcrackers or the series. So, so like in theory, so, that yes. happens in my living room because I have one wall that I can hang a big quilt. Yes. Uh, like up to 86 inches. So yeah. I can hang a bed size quilt on this wall. And in theory, I have a quilt I could hang up there for every month, except I it just it's not a priority for me to like drag the ladder out, take the quilt down, put the new quilt up, roll the other one up and store it properly. And so like my Christmas quilt stayed up until March. <laughs> And I was like, well, it's just red and green with some yellow. It's not, it doesn't actually say Merry Christmas on it. And I'm sure it's fine. And then I was like, oh, I could put the beach quilt up next because we were getting into spring and when we would normally be going to the beach. And I'm like, yeah, but then I have to take that down like August, September. That's going to be a lot of work. So I, know. I put up my but lonely I, rainbow and I'm like, rainbows, always in season. <laughs> Done. <laughs> and we're good. I'm not saying I make them all, but I get caught up in buying a series so that I have the whole kind of series of them kind of thing. That's a lot uh, of energy. It is. It is. But I do get caught up in buying series of stuff. Like, I'm attracted to that. I, I am a complete. I want to be that good of a, yeah. a upkeep of my house, too. I want to be that organized and that cutesy decorator, and it's not happening, but I... You know, I have dreams. I have aspirations. Yeah, there was something about, one like, day. <laughs> physically making two new people that, like, really took me out of that <laughs> dream of achievement. I'm like, maybe when they go to college or leave the house, I don't care what they do, get out. You know, and then I will have energy again. But right now, it just I spend way more time feeling guilty that I haven't swept kitty litter <laughs> instead of swapping out quilts. <laughs> I should have seasonal pillows. Like, oh, or I could not. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I call I, that a timeless look. <laughs> timeless look. <laughs> I don't know. I I do have aspirations. Like I did when I first started quilting, honestly, this is seriously a goal. I thought I could justify making more quilts by saying, I want a quilt for each bed in my house to have the fall quilt, the winter quilt, and the summer quilt and the spring quilt. And then and at that time. Um, you know, we had two guest bedrooms and one of the guest bedroom has twin beds in it. And it's like, oh, I haven't finished it. And then our bed, of course, has to have the fall quilt, the winter quilt, the, the Christmas quilt, which is different from the winter quilt. I have two Christmas quilts for my bed. I do, too. By the way. I do, too. I think it stay on until March. In hey. my defense, we had other quilts on top of it because it was cold. And so you couldn't really see it or tell. And my husband does not. Give two farts on what the quilt it's is. It's like, hey, if I'm warm, I'm good. He didn't care. So he doesn't care. So I made this quilt that for my bed now, and it's going to be the general anytime quilt. <laughs> yeah, I got a couple of those. Because a king size quilt, you got to commit Ooh, to. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. So the other one, the other two bedrooms is a queen and two twins. So I still haven't made all the yeah quilts for those. Yet. My particular problem is. Well, just one of my particular problems, let's be honest. <laughs> um, I'm still drawn to seasonal patterns. I am. Even though, like, I know I have two different Christmas quilts for my bed, king size. I have two different Christmas quilts that I could hang in my living room. And yet I still see a super cute Christmas pattern. I'm like, I could get that. And then I could just make it. And then I'm like, well, what would I do with it? I have just yet another quilt I forget to put up when it's Christmas time. I know. That's I know. My problem. I think that's what I need to do for my niece and nephew, like for the next. And I noticed you and I didn't go to the Christmas in July thing. I wanted to. I had a conflict. But we had a conflict, so we didn't get to go, which I thought, yay, us. I'm glad I didn't get to go because I would have bought something. More Christmas fabric that I really don't need. I'm good about not buying the fabric. Oh, I'm not. Or at least only buying a fat quarter and then think, maybe that's a placement. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my just one fat quarter of Christmas fabric. So, but... Maybe I should start making the Christmas quilt for my niece and nephew and have their... Maybe that's a good Christmas. Don't watch this. <laughs> Kids. Kids. <laughs> I don't think they watch. I'm pretty sure they don't. I'm pretty sure the six-year-old didn't watch yeah. it. Yeah. They're not she our target market. <laughs> the six-year-old, my niece, called the other day. She FaceTimes me at 7 o'clock in the morning when she's eating breakfast because this is when she wants to talk to her Aunt Lynn. And she said... Um, you need to come over here with Uncle Mike and the dogs. Bye. <laughs> and, and my sister's behind her going, she's not coming today. 
<laughs> like, let's make this clear. She's going to expect you if she says bye and hangs up. So anyway, so I've been summoned to my sister's house. All right. By the niece. So I look at, back to our topic, which we have digressed from as normal. Um, I have to like it. I haven't tried it before. Is it a reference? Do I like the author? And is it a series that I'm going to get sucked into? Doesn't mind. Do you... When, okay. Let's say now you have a library established. Of yes. Friends and Let's say that's real. Do you at any time go through and call that and I have, get rid yes. of books? I What's have. your criteria then for letting go of books or patterns? Um, one, it's not signed because a lot of my books are signed by the authors. So if it's a signed copy to me, I keep it. So that's automatically in the keep pile. Two, it's not a big reference that I use for quilt um, appraisal stuff. So I have some historical books about, you know, different s- styles during different historical aspects mm-hmm. of quilting. Um, so I keep all those reference books because some of those are extremely expensive to Yeah, to replace. Re- or- replace, yeah, exactly. Um, so the ones that I'm getting rid of are technique books most of the time. Techniques that you've already mastered or ones that you're just not interested in anymore? Um, most of them are not reference techniques book as in, but they're just books with like, here's five quilts that I made out of jelly rolls or here's whatever. Um, those are the ones that I call. And they really have to look outdated to me. And that's usually from fabric selection it's or from hun- quilt design or both? Uh, both. Yeah. But I can't say I have gotten rid of more, not quilt books, but all those ancillary books. Like, you know, I've got books on how to make different handbags or how to make, I've culled those more Mm -hmm. than I cull the, you know, other books. Do you? Yes. And what, how do you get rid of them? So there was, I've mentioned there was like the Christmas buying period and then I had all the Christmas quilts. I had a ton of patterns and books targeted around baby quilts from when I was, I was just starting quilting. Uh, and it was about, let's see, four years after I started quilting that I got pregnant mm-hmm. with my first child. And so I was like making baby quilts. And so like I made the baby quilt. Okay. Do I need this pattern anymore? <laughs> like I'm never going to make this applique airplane and puffy cloud quilt again i think i can let it go yeah i'll let some of those go so too. some of that that phase, very phase of life stuff yeah when it comes to books lots of times it's a book that i bought because it was for sale used and it only cost a couple bucks i'm like oh i'll spend a couple bucks from the guild library or and get it and then i look at it, i'm like yeah tried the technique once it's not really my bag i'll let that go um, right like you anyone that's been signed particularly by someone i know like that that stays in the library. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't done a, a big culling per se because my library is fairly small. Like my quilt book library is like this much of a shelf. Yeah, mine's like four shelves. Yeah, hers is huge. Now, I don't want mine to get much bigger because then it's going to start infringing on where I can store fabric unless I get another bookshelf. Yeah. And I'm kind of limited in that until uh, I kick the human children out. <laughs> start well, taking over I've another a, room of the house. I've got another closet that I've yet to convert to fabric and um, book storage. So I I already know I have more room. Yeah. I just haven't converted it to the right shelving to hold what I need it to hold. Yeah. So I'm making plans to. I have a file drawer that holds the smaller, like yes. the independent patterns. I have one of those rolling carts that holds all the independent patterns. And I had them organized at one point, but now I don't no. think they are. I used to save every block I from mean, uh, Saturday sampler programs. I do too. Month programs. I do too. And okay. there are some that I was Several like, years. I'll let this go. Or someone has said they're interested. There was a couple years ago a house block program that I, and I saved all those. And then right. someone said, oh, I'd love to make a house quilt block or a house block quilt. Like, oh, here is a handy reference for you. And in retrospect, I'm never going to make another quilt out of these again right so those were very easily to package up and bundle but now since i've gotten eq7 and there's that whole block library in there i don't necessarily need all of these right particularly because i have the pictures of the saturday sampler finished quilts and so i can easily deconstruct like oh that's you know five four patches and four trirex blocks yeah (laughs) So, so I don't yeah. need that written up instruction. I need the written. I needed the written up instructions 
up until I started really designing. And mm-hmm. then it was like, oh, you know, there was, you learn to deconstruct the book. I think it's your journey, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I would go back to those when I was first quilting on how to piece that particular, like a flying geese. I could do a flying geese now and not even think about it, you know, because I understand the components of it, whatever. But now that I'm seasoned enough or have quilted or pieced long enough and written instructions and had to force myself to do math, you know, where theirs were a 12 and a half inch, you know, unfinished block, finished 12. I'm working on eight inch. I've done the math to make it eight inches. Mm -hmm then, you know, I think when you start doing that math, you don't need those instructions yeah, like you did. But I agree. I still have some of that. In fact, I found a tote the other day with a Saturday sampler program that I started and quit halfway through. So I don't even have all the blocks kind of thing. And I'm like, I should give these away. I don't need them. So anyway. All right. Well, what draws you to Patterns of Books? Let us know. Leave a comment on our blog or on the YouTube episode here. And that's all we have for this episode. Today's show was made possible by Ink and Arrow Fabrics because fabric should be fun. Learn more about them and their fun fabrics at inkandarrowfabrics.com. We'd like to thank 77 Peaches, Big Think Productions for helping produce the stitch. And if you've enjoyed the show, please like us, share, share the show, and subscribe to the show. Our next virtual stitch is Friday, September 8th, which is the day that this episode drops, 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern, broadcast live on our YouTube channel. My podcast, Hip to Be a Square, is out Fridays on iTunes or Google Play. And all those details and more can be found on our website, thestitchtvshow.com. Tune in next time for more Quilting Chat with Friends.